David Morgan with you at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, January 2018. Patrick Soros on my right, Foran Mining. We've talked about this for about the last two years. The story keeps getting more interesting. But for people that don't know about Foran Mining, why don't you take us to the who, what, when, where, and why? So I'll break okay. it down. Where is it? What's the deposit? And what's the current status? So Foran Mining is was was uh, a bunch of entrepreneurs that were looking for an opportunity and found Foran Mining in 2011 uh, with the McElvena Bay deposit, uh, basically an orphaned asset. Uh, this particular VMS deposit is the largest undeveloped VMS deposit in the Flin Flon mining belt. So Flin Flon is uh, a mining town uh, run by Hud Bay, had over 16 VMS types of deposits mined there. They occur in clusters over a hundred year mine life. This was the largest one that was undeveloped. It was over 20 million tons an hour west of, of the town of Flin Flon. And we saw it as an opportunity to grab a project and, and uh, try and understand why it hadn't been developed. When we got involved in 2011, it was known as a zinc only project. Mm -hmm. We did drilling in 2011, 12, and then 13 did a re uh, redid the resource on it. It then added another, uh, basically doubled the size of the deposit, took it up to, uh, uh, added another 12 million tons of copper re uh, stockwork resource to it. So now we had a substantial deposit that was ready for PEA. In 20, late 2014, P we issued a PEA on the project. Uh, it, it was, uh, the report came out in 2015. Essentially, what it said was at a at 89 cent dollar uh, at a 106 uh, uh, zinc price at a 308 copper price that this thing had a 14 this project McIlvana Bay had a 14 year mine life. It uh, could be paid off in 4.1 years. It had an after tax IRR of about 19 uh, percent, an NPV after tax of 260 million bucks. It was a go, but in 2015, if you remember, David, mm -hmm. metal prices were not so good. Right. So finding Bottom. anybody to actually pay for us to put a feasibility, uh, you know, to get to get it to move forward would have meant diluting our company. We had run down to a market cap of about eight to ten million bucks. Mm. And it meant basically diluting 100%. Now, some, com some companies have done that, but we as a management group didn't want to do it. And the reason we didn't want to do it is that the management and directors of the company are large shareholders of the company. We would be diluting ourselves. So I own uh, about 4 million shares. My chairman, uh, Mr. Darren Morcom, owns about uh, 12 million shares. The rest of the directors own about a million shares. And a friend of ours, uh, Pierre Lassonde, who's the uh, chairman of Franco Nevada, owns about 12 million shares. So you can see just amongst that group of people, there were about 100 million shares outstanding. There's about 30, 30 some odd percent of the company held by a few people. We are aligned with shareholders in dilution. So what we decided to do was, if we're, we want to advance it to feasibility, so how do you do that? Well, we could sell part of the asset off. So we talked with a large number of companies can you, you know, are you interested in signing an NDA, reviewing the asset they were? And we wanted them to come in, do the feasibility study with us. And we wanted somebody with deep enough pockets that they could also then carry on to production. And if the feasibility was positive, assist us in raising the funds for production. Well, Glencore fit that bill to a T. Glencore is one of the world's largest miners, as you're aware, but they do go slowly. So. Mm -hmm. Darren Morcom, our chairman, I've got to give him all the credit for this. He worked very diligently on keeping Glencore on side and slowly through uh, an eight, eight to 10 month process uh, in 2017, we got a deal done where they have agreed to do a technical study on our project that will take us through feasibility. They're going to cover all those costs. We have to cover the drilling costs. So they will tell us approximately what kind of centers they want the massive sulfide and the copper stock were drilled off at. That will be our dollar to spend. And then once all the drilling is done, they've got nine months to deliver us a feasibility study. In return, what we've agreed to give them is the offtake on McIlvana Bay alone. So we think that's a great deal for us. They think it's a great deal for them because they get another zinc project. They're very keen on helping a junior like ourselves because they have looked at over they say 100 projects and 
all but two of them didn't make their cut, but McIlvaina Bay is one of the ones. So we think that's a credit to McIlvaina Bay that really endorses the project. And, and now it gives us that flexibility to have somebody that's uh, the size of Glencore doing the work. Glencore has also agreed that if the feasibility study is positive, they will do what it takes to assist us in raising funds to get it to production and assist us when we're doing all of the commissioning of the mine to do that too. I mean, we'll have to pay them for that, but sure. that's fine. I mean, that's worth to us oh, as, sure. as a junior company to have somebody that's a mine builder and a mine operator do that with us. We'll take that any day. So we are really quite excited. Oh, I'm excited <laughs> for you. Congratulations. Yes. And the rest of the story is Foran has other projects available beyond this right. that could add to the upside of the company. Right. So the other things that we have on the go on those same properties, we have Big Stone, which is on the Big Stone property. It's separate. It's about 20 kilometers away. It runs about 4 million tons of, uh, it's a historic resource, so I have to be careful. We haven't mm -hmm. brought it up to 43101 standards, but historically they, they delineated about 4 million tons of better than 2% copper. We'd like to get back into drilling that. We tried to do it last summer. We didn't have the funds to do it. This summer coming up, that would be a great thing to do. Our best hole there was 100 meters of 2% copper, mm -hmm. so that really has lots of upside potential. On the actual McIlvaina Bay property itself, just a kilometer and a half away from McIlvaina Bay is a large EM target. Now I know that geophysics and EM, some people hit, some people don't. We are excited about it because this particular charge, when put into the ground, holds the charge for some time and then releases it. We've discussed it with several geophysicists. They say the only thing that can release the charge that slowly has got to be sulfides. They can't tell us it's economic sulfides, but they say it's a sulfide, uh, shall we say, a, a sulfide body. We'll leave it at that. Um, we started to drill this last year. We started late in March, unfortunately. The hole didn't reach its target before an early spring hit in, in, Macle in, in in the, uh, in the uh, Flin Flon region, so we couldn't let the drill go into the swamp, so we pulled out early. We have restarted that hole as of uh, today at the resource conference, and uh, we hope to reach the target depth within the next week. With fingers crossed, we will actually have hit some sulfides in there, and in my estimation, as long as we hit a good package of sulfides and it shows that there are sulfides there. The economics are secondary because it will show that there's yet another massive sulfide just a kilometer and a half away from McIlvaina Bay and the upside remains. So we are really pumped about that. That's one of our upsides. We also have the Thunder Zone that's about six uh, kilometers away from, from McIlvaina Bay. That could use some more infill drilling. We made a discovery using that same EM. That's why I'm, I'm positive mm -hmm. on the EM. Same method. Uh, about three years ago, we drilled uh, about six holes in, into that. Every one of them is hit, run, run good, good grades of copper, four meters of 3% copper uh, and, and better. So again, it's, it's the kind of exploration upside that would have shareholders, should have shareholders excited. So we'll have lots of results coming from McIlvaina Bay, probably 10,000 meters of drilling from McIlvaina Bay once Glencore and we just sit down and decide exactly how much drilling is required. So there'll be a regular news flow from McIlvaina Bay and hopefully with some luck, some upside from Target A and perhaps Thunder Zone. Well, obviously you've got some really good support with Glencore in there. What's your mix between institutional and retail uh, shareholder? Really, we are, we have some institutional shareholders based out of Europe, and uh, we are probably 25% uh, institutional. Or as I've told you, 25, well, more than that, almost 30% of the company is owned by just sure. a group of managers, directors, and Pierre Lassonde. And then a friend, friends of our chairman probably own another 15% of the company, so the rest is retail. So the float's probably pretty tight. It is fairly tight. And what's the share trading like, the shares trading like in, and uh, you know, normal volume? Have you seen any increase in yeah, volume? Yeah, the increase since we've made this <coughs> announcement in volume has been good. We probably trade better than 200,000 shares a day now. 
Uh, we were trading on a, by appointment almost before that, mm -hmm. maybe 10 to 60,000 shares a day. On the announcement, we were, we were at around 36 cents a share as of today, January the 18th, or when we closed, sorry, January the 18th, um, on Friday, the, uh, the share price was at 57 cents. So in the five-week period, we've really had a good move up. And I think, you know, the people are excited about what we're doing. I think the share price is trading up based on the news from Glencore and not from Target A. But I think Target A, if we hit, is a game changer that could really catapult the, st the, the company into the next sort of stage of, you know, having a big project plus a secondary asset to, to develop. Let's explore that possibility. If Let's say that it hits, and so it is a significant increase in market cap to the company. Would you th think that you would go again with perhaps a Glencore type of situation on another project or bring another, pers or another JV in? Or what would be the thinking of the company? I, I think we've always felt that it, de it depends on, on, on exactly how that the results are. Sure. I think if it's a good sulfide hit without fantastic grades, it's always a good idea to bring in somebody as a joint venture partner to take the risk and the dilution away from shareholders. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that be Glencore or some other group, I think there will be enough people lined up to do that if they think there's potential upside there. So, uh, you know, I think Glencore is a great partner. If they were willing to make the right offer, we'd, we'd review anything. We're, we're, Pragmatic group of guys, right. and at the end of the day, as I as I was just telling some shareholders at the show there, we believe in adding net asset value per share. We yeah. don't care about the market cap. Yeah. If you're not adding net asset value per share, if you're not, that share price isn't moving up. We as big shareholders, we want to see it appreciate as much as the other shareholders. It doesn't matter what percentage you own. You want to buy something, and you're investing and taking that risk, but you want it to go up. And so we will do whatever we think is best that will cause that share appreciation. Well, one of the best from my perspective, being you know focused on silver for so long, was Bob Quartermain with Silver Standard. Absolutely. People say, well, there's more shares. Yeah, but you're getting more silver per share now than when he did the deal. Exactly. And it took a while for people to understand. And you know, you you get that, and yes. most savvy investors get right. that as well. So, I, I've often had, it's interesting you say that because I've often had to say to to significant shareholders, if we do a 10% dilution but add 20% of the share value, that's actually not diluted. Correct. <laughs> Correct. No, it, yeah, and it gets fuzzy because, you know, it's uh, one way thinking maybe. Right. That's, well, there's more shares. Yes, there are, but you're getting more value. More return. More return. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I think we've told the story from beginning to end more or less, but maybe I've left something out or forgotten something. So, if I have, is there anything else that our viewers need to know about 4M no, I think that we that haven't pretty discussed? Pretty well covers, you know, uh, you know, hopefully there's some excitement showing in the things we're doing and I and I think as you follow the company during the year I'm hoping that we continue to make significant progress and that hopefully we'll get a chance to talk uh, later this year and I can give you more good news and we'll see how things move along but uh, yeah I think we're we're on the right road we've got the wind in our sails and let's see where it takes us. Patrick always a pleasure and I really think that 2018 is a turnaround year I think that uh, the commodity cycle is coming back and many don't know this, but the, uh, the ETF for base metal mining hit a four-year high about two months ago. Wow. And very few analysts even uh, winked at it or even knew about it. So there is a turn in the market as far as I could tell from our work, and I think that it's going to be a good year for all of us that have suffered for a long oh, time yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the downturn we've seen since 2011. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much, Dave. Good talk.